want to uh, take this opportunity and thank Apostle Theo and Dr. Bev for the great privilege and honor to minister the Word of God to you. As we get into it, you know, uh, for the last week, we've been uh, doing 21 days of prayer. Hasn't that been great? I mean, it's really been awesome, and just going through the prayer first booklet has been amazing, and I want to encourage you to be a part of that. You know, why do we do things like that? Why do we run 21 days of prayer? Is it just because we want to have another program to keep you busy? Absolutely not. There's so many benefits of being part of that, and one of those is so that you could have a God encounter, that you can know that you know what God wants for you for 2022, that you can walk into it, knowing that you've prayed, you've been fasting, that you have a word from God, and that you know that you're going to succeed in 2022. And so with that in mind, I'm going to continue and speak about God encounters tonight. It's part of the series we've just started. And family, I believe that God desires to have more close encounters with you and me. Do you believe that? I believe He wants that. I believe He wants us to know and experience Him better. I believe that there are times where He wants you to experience Him in a powerful way. And so that's why we're doing this series on God Encounters. Because it's got to be more than just a sermon on a Sunday, right? You've got to experience Him when you're at home, when you're at work, wherever you are. You've got to have those times where you're having that experience with Him. Near the end of last year, the last week, in fact, uh, 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 before we went into our Christmas break, we were doing a prayer meeting with our team. And as we were doing this prayer meeting, the Lord really impressed on my heart, Matthew 6, 33. He dropped it strongly into my heart. And, uh, and, he, and, and for me, he said, that's a verse for 2022. And you all know it very, very well. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus is speaking there. And he says, seek first the kingdom. And you know, um, uh, as we're getting into this year and we're doing everything and we're doing 21 days of prayer, we're doing this series, Apostle Theo is ministering on healing to, for, for breakthrough, I really could see that God is desiring for His people to put Him first. You know, I said it the other day that, that the world has been turned upside down and people's priorities have really gone off, off sync a little bit. And so we need to make sure that whatever we are doing, we're putting God first. And so today... I want to talk to you about how God moves in your darkest day. Many of you have looked back and you thought, gee, these last two years have just been terrible. You've, you've been through some challenging times. There were times when, when you got your worst news. God was there. There were times where you perhaps lost a loved one. Your greatest tragedy. I want you to know that God was there, even though you might not have recognized that He was there. You see, church, many times when people go through these challenges, when they get a, 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 some bad news or they have a tragedy, many times some people start to draw away from others and sadly even from God. They draw away, they isolate themselves. They're obviously dealing with those challenges. And many times there are people that even blame God for their tragedy. But God is not far from you. God is the one who's drawing near to you. Listen to what it says here in Psalm 34, verse 18. This is God's posture towards you. It says this, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Isn't that amazing? When you're having that bad time, the worst news, the difficult time, the Bible says he's close to you, but you might not recognize it. You might not feel like it, but that's where he is. You see, church, what we need to know is that when God sees you in that situation, he is making a move toward you. And if we will learn to recognize it, we will benefit from it. We've got to learn to recognize that He's there in those difficult times. Just like in your life, if opportunity comes knocking at your door, if you don't recognize it, you miss it. Isn't that right? And so we need to learn to recognize it. Why? So that you and I can benefit from it and know that He's with us. We all need to learn how to have a better response to pain. You might say, well, no, no, I don't want to learn to have a better response to pain. I don't want pain. I want God to take all of my pain. Wouldn't that be amazing? But you see, the, in the book of Luke, Jesus spoke to us, and this is what he said. He said, if you, you can build your house on the rock or you can build your house on the sand. Whether you've built your house on the rock or on the sand, he didn't say a flood might come. He says, when? He says, when? 
If I had to ask you today, how many of you have never had a challenge in your life, I'm sure there wouldn't be a single hand that goes up. Maybe if you're one years old, <laughs> you might be able to wave your hand. But we've all been through that. There are difficulties and there are challenges. Jesus said in John 16, he says, in this world, you will have trouble. I know we don't like to hear that. You might say, Pastor, can't you be a little bit more positive? I want to be encouraged here today. Well, I want to, I, I want to guarantee you, you can be sure there will be uh, uh, trouble. I'm positive you're going to have some challenges in this life. Okay? But he did say this, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. You see, family, God's plan is for all of us to stand strong during those times of pain. To stand when we're going through, this, through these difficult times. You see, the day is coming where there won't be any pain. The day is coming when you won't have to worry about the car payment and the insurance payment. You won't have to worry about getting up early in the morning on a Monday to go to work. <laughs> that day is coming, but it's not here. That day is in heaven. And we will get there, and we will know that that is a great place, and everything will be great there. There's a place that is perfect, but church, it's not here on earth. I want to be real with you. I want to be open with you. Because if we don't realize and recognize that there are challenges, then we're not going to poise ourselves to see God move on our behalf. And so what does God do? Well, as we read in Psalm 34, verse 18, it says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And it goes on and says this, And He saves those who are crushed in spirit. He saves you. He's there for you in that difficult time. You see, family, very often, and I'm sure there's many of you that will agree with me, very often in our lives, we learn our biggest lessons through our darkest times. Our biggest lessons. You know, I came to the Lord not in a great time. I came to the Lord when, when in my life I was lost, I was confused, my life didn't have a purpose, I really wasn't happy about life. That's when I came to know Him. It was through my darkest time. And if I had to go through the, the church tonight and ask you, how many of you found the Lord or came to the Lord in a challenging time, I'm sure many hands would be raised. It's those, through those challenging times that we learn our greatest lessons, family. You can read through the scriptures of the Bible. Even David became recognized because he had a challenge. <laughs> if it wasn't for that difficult time when Israel was under attack, if it wasn't for that difficult time, he would not have been known. He would have just been there feeding his, his, his brother some food and gone back home. But because of the difficult time, he was elevated. He learned some amazing lessons, and so did Israel. And so it's through these difficult times that we learn our greatest lessons. You see, church, Pain doesn't need to be a problem. It can be a platform for God to do something great in your life if you know how to recognize it. If you'll just know how to recognize it, you can do that. And so the subtitle of this series for tonight, which is the God Encounter, the subtitle is this. No pain, you've guessed it, no gain. No pain, no gain. Now for those of you that are RPs that go to the gym, that's a term you're used to. No pain, no gain, right? And, 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 and I suppose you, when you look at me, you might think, to you, what do you know about gym, Pastor Greg? <laughs> you don't look like you've lifted up anything. Well, I lift up a burger over here. So <laughs> but, uh, but I have been to gym enough times and to CrossFit enough times to know not to go back. But anyway, <laughs> seriously, that is a gym term. No pain, no gain, you know, and they charge you on. Come on, you can do it. And when you're there, you know, in my case, just pushing the bar, but when you're there doing a bench press and you've done as many as you can, they say, come on, one more. And you feel too much. I can't even feel my arms. No, you can do one more. What do they do? They are talking you into resistance for your benefit. You see, muscles don't grow. This is what I've been told. <laughs> muscles don't grow unless you have resistance training. Hey, Pastor Ever. You have to have resistance training. I have to look at the expert. You can see he, he's picked up a few weights. You have to have resistance training for your muscles to grow. That's just how it works, church. You know, there's a, a wonderful man of God by the name of Barry Smith. How many of you remember Barry Smith? What an awesome man of God. He's at home with Jesus. And I'll never forget, he used to say this. He said, good times don't build character. Good times don't build character. Our character is never developed when it's easy, if everything's great. Your character is developed when there are challenges. That's when your character is developed. 
And even though you're facing challenges or you're in the gym now doing your thing, everything in your mind and your emotions wants to resist the pain. But pain can serve a purpose in our life. And so today, tonight, we're going to have a look at that. We're going to study that a little bit. And we're going to do that by looking at the life of Isaiah and just a few verses in Isaiah of, the, of what he learned through pain and the lessons he learned and what God showed him through a challenging time. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to go to Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to read from verse 1, so you can turn there. And in Isaiah chapter 6 from verse 1, it says this. Verse 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now let me give you a little bit of a background. Obviously, Isaiah knew King Uzziah well. And the King Uzziah started off great. He was a wonderful king. He led the nation amazingly, but he didn't end good. He didn't end well. And the nation was regressing. And at that time, while the nation was regressing and he wasn't leading well, that's when the king died. And so in that time, in this dark day in Uzziah's life, he says that in that year, in that time when King Uzziah died, in this dark time of my life, Isaiah said, that's when I saw the Lord. And how did I see him? I saw him seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, if, you need, if you've studied anything about kings, kings had these robes. And the longer and the, and the bigger their robe was, was a, was, a, was a sign of how great they were and, and their, their majesty. And yeah, the Bible is talking about God's robe. And it says, his strain of his robe filled the temple. In other, in other words, there was no place for anything else. That's how awesome our God is. And yeah, in this darkest time, God is saying to Isaiah, I'm here. Recognize me. I'm your king. I'm around you wherever you are. I'm with you. That's what he got to learn. God showed him, even in your dark day, I'm there. You're not alone. He goes on to say in verse 2, and, um, and above him were seraphims, these angels, and they were calling to one another. And this is what they were saying. This is what Isaiah learned and what he saw. They were calling to one another and they were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Isn't that amazing? They didn't say, oh, we feel so sorry for you, Isaiah. It will be okay. Yeah, Isaiah was being taught a lesson. God was showing him, in your darkest days, you've got to learn to worship me. You've got to learn to worship me. Now, church, I, I, I love singing uh, uh, songs that tell us how wonderful our journey is and how amazing it is and how good uh, uh, our life can be. That's nice. And it's wonderful singing songs to say, Lord, I need this. Come and touch me. Come and down. Help me. Bless me. That's wonderful. But we need to learn how to worship Him. We need to sing songs that lift Him up. I mean, that time we sang tonight, they could have just done that for an hour. Wasn't that awesome? Just magnifying our God. And this is what, uh, this is what God was showing Isaiah. In your darkest day, if you will just learn to worship me, I will, be there. I will come and touch your heart. I will be with you. And so the, he was learning from God, I need to magnify you. I need to focus on you not on my challenge. And that's what he learned. And it says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth, listen to this, is full of his glory. The whole earth. What does that mean, church? Well, for Isaiah or for you or for me, it means that his glory was there when you lost your loved one. His glory was there when you got that bad news. His glory was there because it fills the whole earth. You see, and Isaiah realized that God was bigger than any problem that he faced. He came to realize he's this big God. He's filling the whole earth. Surely my problem is insignificant compared to my God. And that's what he learned as he saw God, that God was bigger than any problem he faced. And if he could recognize it, and if we can recognize it, then church, we will stand through those difficult times. You see, in verse 4, it goes on and it says this, at the sound of their voices, these angels that were singing, holy, 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 at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook. 
Doorposts and thresholds are normally the stable place. It's normally a firm thing. A doorpost is a stable place. A threshold is a stable place. And yeah, he's learning that where in my life, when I think things were stable, my doorposts were shaking. But God was saying, I'm with you. I'm going to be your firm foundation. I'm going to be there. And it goes on to say, and the temple was filled with smoke, with the presence of God. You see, church, when we are having our darkest day, we need to remember this. Listen to this. When something is happening to me, God wants to reveal himself in me. He desires that. He wants to reveal himself in you in your darkest day. That's what he wants to do. But it doesn't stop there. He's learning these lessons that I need to recognize God is there. He's learning these lessons that I need to worship God. And he was with me in those darkest moments. And then it goes on in verse 5 to say, Woe to me. I cried, I am, a, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. You see, church, right here, this is a great revelation that is often followed by a bad choice. And I'll explain that to you in a moment. Yeah, he realizes that in the presence of God, he's a sinful man. That's what he realized. He realized his shortcomings. He realized his sin. He realized his failure. He even recognized that those who were around him were the same. It says, and I live among people of unclean lips. He recognized in the presence of God what his mistakes were. And the challenge that most people face is that in the presence of God, when we're worshiping the Lord, we recognize our shortcomings, but many times we then hide from God because of them. And that's the wrong outcome of a great revelation. To recognize, hey, these things are wrong. What must I do with it? Look what it says. And my eyes have seen the King Almighty. You see, church, when we see God clearly, we see ourselves clearly. I mean, if I see the Lord clearly, I'm going to see who I really am. Why is that important? That's important not for condemnation, because condemnation shames us for what we've done, and God doesn't want to condemn you. But it's there to show us for conviction, because conviction shows us how we can change. Condemnation is not the work of the Lord. Conviction is because he wants you to change. He wants you to recognize what your failings are so you can change and do something about it, not run from him, but run to him. And it says in Isaiah 6 from verse 6, it says this, Then one of the seraphims flew to me, with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Family, that's what God wants to do. But if we're running, for him, we're running from him, we can't have that. It's when we run to him that we can be free from our mistakes and our challenges. And so this is what he recognized. God, you're a good God. In my darkest day, even with my failings, you are good to me. You are good to me. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Now I found that to be so interesting. Yeah, he's going through his darkest day. He's finding out all these wonderful things about God, what he needs to do, how he needs to approach God. And yeah, God now asks him a question, who can I send? In his darkest day, God is giving him a, 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 a plan for his life. He's starting to get him to be uh, involved and active in what God wants him to do. He says, whom shall I send? Who will go for us, God says, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And Isaiah recognized that God wanted him to do something about what he had just gone through. And he said, here I am, send me. You see, church, when we see ourselves clearly, we see our future clearly. If I can see myself clearly in the presence of God, I'll know that he has a plan for my life. I'll know that he wants me to do something with what I've just experienced. You know, just after World War II, uh, there was this doctor called Dr. Viktor Frankl, and he was a Jewish psychiatrist, and he was given the responsibility to help the uh, survivors of the Holocaust, the people that had survived the Holocaust. And uh, he was given the responsibility to help them. They were all suicidal, as you can imagine. They had no purpose for their life. They were just really existing. It was terrible for them. And in fact, he wrote an amazing book, which is titled Man's Search for Meaning, which has almost been a bestseller for a nearly, nearly 100 years. Can you believe that? It's an amazing book. But anyway, 
And uh, he was given the responsibility to treat these Holocaust victims. And he came up with a different understanding of what he needs to do with them. You see, others, like people like Freud, they believed that your goal in life was pleasure. The goal of life is pleasure. That's what they believed. But he said, no, 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 that's not right. He says, the goal of life is purpose and meaning. And if you don't have purpose and meaning, then you fill your life with pleasure, and eventually the pleasure is not enough. That's what he found out. This is what Franklin found out. And he said, you have to give people purpose and meaning. Because if you just give them pleasure, Freud believed, I just let them play chess and walk and plant gardens and, and just enjoy life, and they'll learn to live with their pain. And he says, no, you can overcome it. Franklin says, you can overcome it. You can get them free. And then he came up with something called logos therapy. Logos therapy. And this is what it was. Simple, three, but life-changing things. He said this. The first thing you need to do is you need to help people to find, to do meaningful work. They have to do meaningful work, work that makes a difference, like dream team. <laughs> Amen. Being on a dream team makes a difference. You have to help people find something meaningful, something that will make a difference in somebody's life. He said that's the first thing. Then he said the second thing they need to do is you have to find people and a community to belong to. You can't do it alone. Small groups. <laughs> You have to do it. You see, family, real life change happens in the context of relationships. If you could fix yourself, you would have done it. We need each other. We need the Lord, obviously. But, I mean, we need people. God has made it that way. So he said, you have to find something meaningful to do. You have to find a community to belong to and do it with them. And then he said this, the third thing. He says, you have to find reason and purpose for your suffering. Why are you going through what you're going through? What are you going to do about it? And to use it in some way to help others. That's what he said. Those are the three things. And so what all these doctors and scientists are only discovering now in the last number of years, God has been telling us for thousands of years. He's been telling us that for thousands of years. If you go to Genesis chapter 50, you all know the story of, of Joseph, how his brother sold him. They wanted to kill him, but they sold him as a slave. You remember that story? He ended up working in Potiphar's house. He got falsely accused there. He got mistreated there. He got thrown in prison. He was obviously uh, then forgotten in prison. Uh, people that promised they'd remember him forgot him. Can you imagine the rejection he could have felt and the difficulty? You talk about having dark days. <laughs> he has a man that was innocent, getting sold as a slave, then getting uh, uh, um, wrongly accused, and then getting forgotten in prison when he shouldn't have even been there. But yet, it turned out that he became the second most powerful man in Egypt. And look what he said. This is what he said. He went through all of that, and he said this. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many. He did something about his hardship. He did something about it. He didn't let it destroy him. He used it to be a benefit to others. That's what he did. You see, family, we all need to recognize there is purpose in your pain. There's purpose in my pain. My pain is not just my pain. What am I going to do about it? Am I going to make a difference with it? Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. You see, church, we can redefine a bad day and turn it into something good. We can. We can. Let me tell you a little story, a little humorous story. There was this African king, and this African king had a servant who actually was also his best friend. And they were great friends, and they would do everything together. But this servant was extremely positive. I mean, he was like seriously positive. If it was a sunny day, he'd say, this is good. If it was a rainy day, he would say, this is good. If it was snowing, he would say, this is good. If there was a drought, he would say, this is good. So he was just an extremely positive guy. So one day the king and him are out hunting. And as they see the animal over there, the servant loads the gun and gives it to him. As the king takes it and is about to aim, the gun misfires and explodes and it blows off his thumb completely gone. And the king turns to the servant and says, what have you done? And he says, this is good. <laughs> and the king said, no, this is bad. And he took him back and he threw him in prison. Anyway, a year later, the king's out hunting again. And he's out there hunting. And then he gets captured by some cannibals. 
And now they're about to eat him. They're going to eat him. And one of them recognizes he doesn't have a thumb. And so they are very superstitious. They won't eat anything that's not whole. So they let him go. He, and he comes to realize, see, what have I done with my friend? I, I've, I've mistreated my friend. So he goes back and he gets him out of the prison and he tells him the story. And he says to him, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have locked you in prison. I made a mistake. It was wrong of me. And he says, this is good. He says, how can you say this is good? I locked you in jail for a year. He says, no, this is good. Because if I was with you, they would have eaten me. <laughs> you see, family, my pain is either a jail that imprisons me or a school that empowers me. You choose. Your pain is either a jail that imprisons you or it is a school that empowers you. What are you doing with the things you've been through? What are you doing about it? You see, church, we need to learn. There are three responses that we need to have. Three responses. And the first one is this. Number one, we need to stop running from God and run to God. Too many people are running from the Lord. Too many people are doing that. The Isaiah 55 verse 6 says this, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. There are some of you here today, maybe watching online, and you're just saying, look, I'm just going to do enough, just enough to make sure I can get to heaven. Family, that's not what it's all about. You need to seek God. You need to draw closer to Him. God has more for you. You need to make that decision. I don't know who you are. Maybe you're just unsure how far you want to get committed in the things of God. I'm telling you, you're far better off all in than half in. Half in doesn't help. All in. We need to be all in. It says here in Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Maybe you're wondering, why am I not experiencing God in the way that others say? Because you're not seeking him with all your heart. All your heart. Putting him first. So I want to encourage you. Whatever, when you go through difficult times, don't run from God. Run to him. The second thing that we need to learn is that we need to take the steps to grow. We need to take steps to grow, family. One of the reasons... Bad days kick people around is because there is no depth to their life. No depth to their life. Have you ever seen a plastic bottle on the ocean? I'm sure you've seen it. It just bobs around on the ocean. The smallest waves push that bottle around. The smallest ones. It doesn't have to be big ones. The smallest ones push that little plastic bottle all over the place. If you compare that little plastic bottle to a massive oil tanker, Massive oil tanker. Those big oil tankers don't even feel the little waves. They don't even know they're there. What's the difference between the plastic bottle and the oil tanker? It's weight, stability, maturity, strength. That's what it is. And we need to, we need to make decisions to grow. Family, it's time to grow. 2022 is a time to grow. You see, 1 Peter 2 from verse 2 says this. You must crave pure spiritual milk so that you can grow into the fullness of your salvation. Cry out for this nourishment as a baby cries for milk. We need to be hungry for the things of God. We need, to, we need to make decisions to grow in the things of God. And it goes on in verse 3 to say, now that you have tasted of the Lord's kindness. I want to speak to somebody here tonight. And I want to say to you, you may have been serving the Lord, given your heart to Him maybe years ago, but you have not been baptized. You need to be baptized. You need to make a decision to be baptized. The Bible says repent and be baptized. Maybe you're wondering why you're going around the same mountain. You need to fully obey the Lord and get into the waters of baptism. It's what we need to do. That's one of the areas you can grow in. Many of you are in church and go home and come to church and go home. That's not enough. You need to get into a group. You need to be part of a family that will care for you. Get into one. Make that decision. Anything that's worth having is going to cost you. Anything. And so your walk with God is going to cost you. You're going to have to pay the price. Get into a group. You might say, I'm busy. We must not ever be too busy for the things of God, church. There are some of you here who still don't trust God with the time. Still don't trust Him with the time. He said we must trust Him and test Him. He told us to. You need to make that decision. Tithing is not for me. Tithing is for you. If you're not doing I'm tithing. I'm not asking you to tithe to change. Tithing, I can promise you now, I'm so grateful that I learned that truth. It's a covenant relationship. 
you need to make that decision. Church, listen to me. It's time to grow. We need to recognize where we are, what's happening around us. We need to be people that are praying every day. We need to be people that are reading the Bible every day. And I know I'm speaking to the converted crowd, but we need to be people that are in church every Sunday. We need to be in the house of God. We need to make those decisions to grow. And when we do, by doing these things, we'll become stable like that massive oil tanker. That the waves of life won't be able to push you around. You'll be firm, strong. You'll get from your one point to the other and your destination without being moved around because you're choosing to grow. And then the last one is this. Allow God to use what you have been through to help others. Allow Him to use you through the difficulty that you've been through for the purpose of helping others. Remember this, church. You, uh, what you have been through in your life does not disqualify you. It qualifies you. You might be sitting here today and you might have been on the verge of a divorce and your marriage is now restored. You've got something to share. You might be sitting here today and you may have been, have, have been a drug addict, but today you're clean and you're free and you've been free for a long time. You have something to share. You have something to help people with. You need to make that decision. In 2 Corinthians 1 from verse 3, it says this, All praise to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the source of every mercy and the God who comforts us. Listen to this, verse 4. He comforts us in all our troubles. Why? Why? So that we can comfort others. When others are troubled, We are able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Why is that so? So that in the area that you have hurt the most, you can help the most. You see, church, you have something to offer. When we do these things, that's how we turn a bad day around. I'd like you just to bow your heads. I want to pray for you all this evening. As we've looked at this message, no pain, no gain. I want to pray for you. There are many that are here today or online and you're in pain. You're in your dark day. Perhaps you don't see a way out. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God will strengthen you. So just bow your heads. This is for everybody that's going through a difficult time. Let me pray for you. Thank you for watching the Christian Family Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join our online community and join us live every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and share this with your friends. Thank you again for watching and God bless you.